Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning Believe it or not, I was once your age too, and I am the product of Mennonite education myself. I graduated Bethany Christian High School in Goshen, Indiana, which is a Mennonite high school uh, in the Midwest. It's good to be with you today, and I'm excited uh, that you have been working on uh, the service project, uh, collecting relief kit supplies and clothing for Syrian refugees, as um, Pastor uh, John talked about here. Um, and I know that you're having a family service night tomorrow night on the elementary campus. I'll also be at the elementary campus this afternoon uh, to share a little bit some of the same kinds of things I'm sharing with you uh, today. So it's an exciting collaboration between Doc Mennonite Academy and Mennonite Central Committee. So we're glad for that. I want to start with a little bit of history. Anybody in this room attend Blooming Glen Mennonite Church? Okay, quite a few. Anybody know who this might be, given the fact that I asked about Blooming Glen? This was a member of Blooming Glen Mennonite Church. What do you think? Clayton Kratz. That is indeed who this is. Do you know who Clayton Kratz was or what's special about him? Why do you remember him? Not really? Uh, he was one of the very first three MCC workers, so MCC's history uh, is almost 100 years old. MCC started in 1920. There were Mennonites in Ukraine uh, who were in need. They wrote to Mennonites in North America, and a group of Mennonites came together, and that's why it's called the Mennonite Central Committee. Different types of Mennonites came together and said, we need to respond to our sisters and brothers in Ukraine who are in need. Clayton Kratz, along with two other young men, Ori Miller and Arthur Slagle, were sent to Ukraine to see what was happening and how this newly formed group in 1920, the Mennonite Committee, might be able to help. So that's the, the origins of MCC. And as I said, we're approaching our centennial. The reason we particularly remember Clayton Kratz is partly, you know, from Blooming Glen Mennonite Church, only 10 miles from where we stand here today. He was a recent Goshen College graduate, and as he went to Ukraine, there was fighting happening. If you think about your history of the Soviet Revolution, which started in 1917, that was still working itself out in 1920. There was still fighting in Ukraine, which had been part of the Russian Empire. And uh, Clayton Kratz, the story goes, was in a Mennonite village, and they knew that fighting was approaching the village. And so Clayton said, okay, I'll spend the night here yet tonight, and I'll leave in the morning. And the fighting overcame the village in the night uh, faster than anticipated. And the last that Clayton Kratz was ever seen or heard from, he was being taken away from that village by one of the fighting forces. People looked for him for some months and years after other Mennonite workers, NCC workers who would be in that area, would ask about him, but he was never seen nor heard from again. So in some ways, kind of a modern Mennonite martyr, uh, right at the origins of NCC's uh, work in 1920. And a local boy. Clayton Kratz, who again, following Christ's call on his life in service, he, he uh, sacrificed that life in service to God, so we remember him today. I want to reflect a little bit today about our calling as people of faith, uh, as Christians. Uh, this is a quote from a Mennonite brethren pastor in Colombia, in South America. He said, it's not just about knowing the Bible, but about putting it into practice. Not a theology of books, but a theology of of the heart. So as people of faith who take uh, the scriptures seriously, who take the life of Christ seriously, what does that mean uh, in our lives, how we carry ourselves uh, in the world, how we respond to those around us? How can we use our gifts and talents and vocations to, ser to serve God, to show Christ's love in our local communities and the broader world? So that's a kind of a framework for what I want to share with you today, this idea of putting our faith into practice, what uh, David Bonilla, this pastor in Columbia, called uh, a theology of the heart. A big focus of MCC's work in recent years has been the Syrian civil war. Uh, the Syrian civil war started six years ago, and when you're young like you guys are, that's a long time ago, you can think about I was in whatever, fifth grade or whatever, when this war started. Um, it has become MCC's largest humanitarian response in our 100-year history, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, again, you folks are young. The tsunami happened about 12 years ago in Asia. That was MCC's biggest response at that time. Uh, but now the Syrian civil war has become our biggest humanitarian response. And one of the reasons for that is 
when something like the tsunami happens in Asia 12 years ago, or the devastating earthquake in Haiti about seven years ago, the event happens, and then you begin the long process of recovery and rebuilding. What's happening in Syria today with the six-year civil war is that the event just keeps happening and happening and happening and happening. People are continually being displaced, lives are lost, people are injured, and people are having to flee uh, their homes. These two boys are in a refugee camp, a Syrian refugee camp in the neighboring country of Jordan. Uh, most of the refugees from Syria are in neighboring Jordan, neighboring Lebanon, and neighboring Turkey, and many, many are displaced within Syria itself, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. And I know that your initiative here has been about providing kits to families around the world whose lives have been disrupted by war or disaster, and that's clearly the case uh, with these young men and millions of other Syrians. This is MCC's mission statement, uh, a worldwide ministry of Anabaptist churches sharing God's love and compassion for all in the name of Christ by responding to basic human needs and working for peace and justice and envisioning communities worldwide in right relationship with God, with one another, and creation. If you've known MCC, if this is the first you've ever heard of Mennonite Central Committee or if you've known about it for 50 years, this is a very consistent part of who we are. And we've said from the very first days of MCC that our work is carried out in the name of Christ. Christ is our motivation, putting our practice uh, into faith. In the work that we do around the world, three essential priorities. Uh, disaster relief is the first. Natural disasters, man-made disasters like a civil war, like the six-year-old civil war in Syria. Sustainable community development is the longer-term work that we do around the world, things like agriculture, education, uh, health, uh, access to water. All of those things will be part of this long-term work that NCC is doing as we walk with communities who are trying to uh, take control of their own uh, lives and live lives of dignity. And finally, justice and peace building as an Anabaptist organization, Mennonite, Brethren in Christ, Amish, etc. Uh, this following of Christ's call to nonviolence is woven through all of the work that we do. It's an area of work, but it's also woven through everything else. So it impacts even the way we respond to disasters and the way we do long-term community development work. So again, we see people affected uh, from Syria. Again, you can see here uh, people of, of multiple generations, children, uh, young people, uh, parents uh, who are struggling. I mentioned that there are millions of displaced in Syria. Imagine this statistic, uh, if you will. Syria has a population of about 22 million people, and 11 million of those are not in their homes. So half of the population of Syria is displaced. Can you imagine if suddenly half of your community was no longer living in their homes, having to flee because of violence, uh, because of fear for their lives, often fleeing with not much on their, just the clothes on their back and what they can carry. That's the reality of Syria today. Most of those people are actually internally displaced, going from an area of Syria that's less safe to an area that is safer but many millions as well are outside of Syria. And I mentioned the three countries where most of them are, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, and Turkey. There are even some Syrian refugees in Western Iraq. If you can imagine people feeling like Iraq is a place of safety to which they can go uh, from civil war in their own country. One of the people that I think of as uh, a hero of the faith these days is this man. This is Bishop Selwanos of the Syrian Orthodox Church. Uh, he was working in the city of Homs in Syria. If you followed uh, the Syrian civil war at all over the years, you may recognize some of these names of cities, places like Aleppo and Homs. I'll say a little bit more about Aleppo in a moment. But Bishop Selwanos was a bishop in Homs, and he remains there uh, today doing the work of the church. NCC has partnered with the Syrian Orthodox Church for many years. And because of the courageous and dedicated work of church leaders like Bishop Salwanos, even today, as you see, is able to get assistance inside Syria itself. Um, it's one thing to work with refugee populations in neighboring countries that are more stable, like Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, but to actually work inside Syria itself 
is based on the fact that MCC has over 25 years of experience working in Syria, long-term relationships with partners on the ground, like the Syrian Orthodox Church. And I think some of you may be surprised to see a Christian leader from Syria. I think often when we think of this part of the world or think about the Middle East, we think uh, of Islam, uh, of Muslims. And certainly, uh, Islam is the dominant religion uh, in Syria and neighboring countries. But there are Christian communities in those places, and some of them are very, very ancient, reaching back to the time of Christ himself. And if you think about the capital city of Syria being Damascus, you read about Damascus in the Bible. So these are origins that are coming from the origins of the very early church. So MCC's work in Syria is possible because of heroic church leaders, uh, Christian uh, people wanting to be involved in their communities like Bishop Salwanos. And so I think of him and remember him as a hero of the faith uh, today. And I encourage you to, when you think about Syria or hear about the Syrian civil war, think about Bishop Salwanos and say a prayer for him and his community and homes and all those people he's trying to help. And I should also say that one of the meaningful things about this work is that when the Syrian Orthodox Church and Homes, uh, under Bishop Selwanos' leadership, when they are responding to the needs of people, they're not only responding to Syrian Orthodox Christians. Uh, they're responding to everyone in the community who is in need. And that includes Muslims, uh, predominantly, and others. So this reaches across faith boundaries to say, God is at work in my life, and we're reaching out in the name of Christ, but we're helping people no matter who they are, based on their need. And I think that's an inspiring story from what's happening in Syria as well. We now jump to an image from Iraq, and one of the things I want to note here is that those who are affected the most, the most in some of these destabilizing situations of violent conflict are the oldest and the youngest. Uh, we saw some children earlier, and I have some other images of young people, but we also have older people. Uh, often less capable to uh, take care of themselves, maybe to journey long distances. And so it's the most vulnerable who are the most affected uh, in violent conflict. Uh, this man here, again, is in Iraq, uh, and he's carrying a food parcel uh, that's been made available by MCC. So as MCC is helping people to address their basic human needs, that includes the kinds of things you've been collecting for the relief kits, uh, largely hygiene items and things like that so that people can care for themselves, like the clothing that you've been collecting uh, for Syrian refugees in Lebanon, but it also includes things like food uh, and access to water and shelter. You can see behind this man some of the tent-like structures that uh, Syrian refugees are living in uh, in refugee camps in Jordan. Men of Silence was an early Anabaptist or Mennonite leader from the Netherlands, uh, he left the Catholic priesthood in 1536 and became a leader in this new movement that eventually became uh, the Mennonite movement. And in fact, it's from his name, Menno, that we get the term uh, Mennonite. And this is something that he said about faith uh, in the 16th century. True evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. It clothes the naked. It feeds the hungry. It comforts the sorrowful. It shelters the destitute. It serves those that harm it. It binds up that which is wounded. And so again, what does it mean? Uh, this reminder from our friend from Colombia, Pastor Bonilla, about this idea of a theology of the heart. Uh, we can read scripture, we know Christ's call, God's call on our lives, but what does it mean in the way we behave? And, and this early Anabaptist leader, Menno Simons, uh, described true evangelical faith this way. This image is from the Democratic Republic of Congo, another area that has been wracked by violence and many displaced people. Um, and I think when I see an older woman like this, I think of the, the history and the story that she carries uh, in her own life. Um, I lived and worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo for eight years with the Mennonite Central Committee uh, when I was in my 20s and into my uh, 30s. And so this touches me in a particular way. And I think about this reminder from uh, Menno Simons that True evangelical faith clothes the naked, it feeds the, the hungry, it shelters the destitute. And so that's how God calls on us to engage the world, uh, is through this theology of the heart, through making our faith practical. Who in this room is 14 years old? Can you raise your hand if you're 14? Few people willing to admit that they're 14. Uh,
this young man is also in Iraq, and he's 14 years old. So if you can imagine yourself in a situation like his, having been forced to flee your home, his was in Syria, to a refugee camp in Jordan. And again, he has a food uh, packet here. And again, as I referenced, older people, younger people, the most vulnerable are always those most affected by violent conflict. Can you put yourself uh, in his shoes today? Can you imagine what that would be like to have to flee your home with almost nothing with your family uh, and live as, alongside millions of other Syrians uh, fleeing that devastating civil war? Another church leader who is inspirational to me from Syria is this man, Reverend Ibrahim and Sarah. Uh, he is a pastor with the Arab Evangelical Presbyterian Church, and he's from the city of Aleppo. And Aleppo has been talked about quite a bit in the Syrian Civil War. It was one of the largest cities in Syria. Um, and, and Reverend Sarah has, has shared along his journey of, he has remained in Aleppo with his family. And he's really struggled with, uh, with the safety even of his own personal family, but has decided that God has put a call on his life to serve the community. Uh, and that includes through remaining there with his family uh, to say that we want to stay here. And he has also been a channel of MCC assistance and other assistance to get to people uh, in communities uh, inside Syria itself. So another hero of the faith to remember, uh, Bishop Solanos earlier from uh, Holmes and Reverend Sarah from Aleppo. In 2017, uh, at Mennonite Central Committee, we're reflecting on this verse. Uh, we have about a thousand workers around the world at any time, so this has gone out to all of our workers, it's gone out to our board members, and we're inviting MCC constituents as well to reflect on this idea of loving our neighbor that we read about in Matthew 22. So it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is again making faith practical. We love God with all of our hearts, but what does that mean for how we love our neighbor? And of course the question of who is our neighbor, uh, close at hand and also far away. In MCC's work with uh, displaced populations around the world, we've been focusing in recent years on children, and young people. Uh, this is the summer camp for Syrian refugee children in Lebanon. Uh, MCC, as I said, has been focusing some energies on trying to provide some level of normalcy for kids whose lives have been turned upside down, often not having access to schooling for extended periods of time. So MCC is working with education and other things for young people to have a safe place to be and enrichment in their lives and a small sense of normalcy in an otherwise uh, difficult life. We think about uh, families, uh, in a Syrian refugee family uh, in Jordan, and it's people like these who are our neighbors. I think when Christ calls on us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, these are the kinds of neighbors he's thinking about. Yes, people around the corner and people close to us, I think that's real, but also in the world that we live in today, our neighbors are those even far away, uh, those who are, who are suffering, who God calls us to reach out to. Another reminder of the kind of work God calls us to do is from Matthew 25. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you get it to be. This verse of reaching out to the least of these in our midst is, is again at the foundations of the work of Mennonite Central Committee for nearly 100 years, which again is only made possible through the courageous people on the front lines like Bishop Salvanos, Reverend Sayer, church leaders uh, in Syria. And those partnerships are part of NCC's work around the world, walking with the least of these. This is a picture before the war uh, in homes, actually. Uh, an orphanage that MCC was working with, a global family partner in our education work. Uh, all of these people have been displaced, but MCC is continuing to walk with these communities. 
I mentioned that we, um, we often don't think of Christianity when we think of the Middle East. Uh, this is a Christian seminary uh, called St. Peter's Seminary. It is in northern Iraq. Uh, many people have fled to this area from Mosul. We've been hearing lately, if you're paying attention to the news about fighting in Iraq, the city of Mosul, uh, people fled from there eastward uh, toward this area, toward Irbil, and this is where uh, we find an Iraqi Christian community and St. Peter's uh, Seminary. And uh, a student at this seminary uh, wrote a prayer about his experience of displacement, and I want to read that uh, to you today. His name is Martin Bonnie, a student at St. Peter's Seminary in Ankawa, which is close to Irbil. Uh, in northern Iraq. He had to flee his home in a place called Karamlesh, which is in Iraq's Nineveh plain. Again, we talked about the Bible. We hear Nineveh, and we think of some Old Testament stories uh, related to this part uh, of the world. So he wrote this prayer as a reflection on Christ carrying the cross. So I'll read an English translation of Martin Bonney's prayer, a Christian student at St. Peter's Seminary in northern Iraq. As you carried your cross, O oh Lord, we carried it too. We lost everything except the cross hanging around our necks and in our cars. We looked at this cross when we were forced to leave our houses. It is the cross of the pain and the hope. The cross of the sadness and the hope. The cross of the resistance and the steadiness. Of those who endure injustice but respond to it in love even when we feel that the injustice is increasing. We carry this cross from our lands in Nineveh to other lands, and we still hang on to it. In spite of all this, we can see the smiles on our faces. You feel the goodness of our neighbors. We are full of hope and trust in you, O oh Lord. And so again, an image of, of kids, kids receiving kits. As I mentioned, among the most effective in MCC is walking uh, with young people uh, in many ways in situations of displacement around the world. Just a reminder that we are living in unprecedented times uh, now in the world. They say there are more than 60 million people who are displaced in the world today, refugees or internally displaced people. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees said recently that we are seeing here the immense costs of not ending wars, of failing to resolve or prevent conflicts. Peace is today dangerously in deficit. There are more people displaced in the world today than there were at the end of World War II, uh, which is a staggering number to think about. And of course, uh, many of those, uh, as I said, 11 million displaced because of the Syrian conflict, but if you think of other parts of the world, South Sudan currently, uh, the long-term effects in Somalia of destabilization and violence in other parts of the world, this is the reality for more than 60 million people in the world. And those who are displaced are among the most vulnerable and marginalized people uh, in the world. And the UN High Commissioner for Refugees saying a big part of the problem is not resolving conflict and not ending war. So, Mennonite calls to nonviolence and working for peace and justice are critical in addressing uh, these issues together. One of the, the lament, laments that I hear as I travel is that we often talk about peace. Uh, Jeremiah 6.14 says, They have treated the wound of my people carelessly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. We talk about peace, but people are living in violence. How do we make the words that come out of our mouth with God's strength uh, into reality for people so that people can live lives of dignity in their context. This image is actually from Palestine and Israel. It's a, a peace dove wearing a bulletproof vest, so kind of a, an image of this challenge for peace in the world that we live in today. Again, images of young people in your collection and sharing with those around the world whose lives have been disrupted by war or disaster bring smiles to kids' faces uh, like this. Uh, so this is a smile of thanks for the work that you're doing. As we near the end here, I want to share one more uh, scripture uh, from Colossians 3 with a couple of invitations. The first is to clothe ourselves with love. 
As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with meekness and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect union. And also to be thankful, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So be thankful, give thanks to God. And as we do that, we can think about what does that mean? We're thankful for what we have, have been blessed with in our communities. What does that mean for how we engage the world with this theology of the heart, this practical faith that reaches out to the least of these? Again, uh, cute pictures of kids bringing joy to children's faces. This is a Syrian refugee girl in the country of Jordan. I think fear is at the basis of a lot of the things we're experiencing in the world today. Uh, MCC invites uh, us to fear not, but to seek peace. And that's peace in our homes, in our communities, and in the world. So this isn't only about people far away. This is also about blessing people and living this practical faith in our own communities uh, with the marginalized. How can we respond to these of persons on the margins in our own communities? There has to be a connection between the local and the global. And now we want to show the, a video, a short video, of Syrian refugees in 